Welcome to your College Bound Kid, a podcast for parents, college counselors, students, and anyone who wants a weekly deep dive into the world of college admissions. My name is Dave. I'm a parent of a daughter in college, and we live in Chicago, Illinois. I'm Lisa, and I'm a clinical psychologist and college counselor. I have a daughter in college, a daughter in high school, and a son in middle school. After 30 years in Chicago, we recently moved to North Carolina. My name is Mark. I'm a college coach in Atlanta and the parent of two daughters, Karis, a graduate of Davidson College, and she is the founder of the Spanish tutoring company, SpanishHelpToday.com. And Joy is a graduate of the University of Georgia, and she is getting her master's degree at North Carolina State University. Good evening, friends. And it's been a while since I've said that. I'm used to saying good morning, friends, but I'm recording this Saturday evening. I normally record Monday episodes on Sunday. And the reason for that is because at 5 a.m., I'm headed to the airport, flying into Seattle on a college fly-in program, which I'm really excited about, be with 41 counselors from all over the country. So when you get this and listen to this, I could be at UPS, University of Puget Sound. That's where I'll be the morning of Monday in Tacoma, Washington. Or if you're listening in the afternoon or early evening or late evening, I'll be in Walla Walla, Washington, visiting Whitman College. Before I I go on and say anything else, I have to give a shout out to somebody who's a podcast listener. Just shows the kind of community that we have here. That's why I refer to you as our listening family. Uh, I'm going to say his first and last name because I want to give him recognition. Uh, But one of our listeners uh, heard me mention that I was taking this trip. And he reached out to me and said, uh, what time do you get in? Because I'd love to drive you around. And a shout out to Jeff Taraday. Uh, Jeff is taking me around and showing me several schools, UW, others in Seattle as well, uh, because I don't have to be at my hotel until four o'clock on Sunday, and I get in at 10.30 a.m. So I'm going to hang out with one of our listeners, and I'm really excited about it. It's just awesome that we have listeners like that. By the way, get used to hearing me all over the country. Your head may be spinning. One of the reasons I, I wanted to resign from my my job as director of college counseling at the CBO I worked for after 14 years was I wanted to get out and do more visits. The hardest part for me with the pandemic was not being able to visit colleges. I like to visit at least 30 a year. I prefer to visit 50. And um, there were at least one year there where I got to under 10. So I'm trying to make up for it. So I'm going to be all over. In April, I'll be in Ohio and Florida and South Carolina visiting. In May, I'll be in North Carolina. In June, I'll spend a week in the Nashville area. In July, I'm back to California um, again. And I'll be sure to do many updates for you guys and college spotlights on our travels. Okay, friends, I want to share a speak pipe comment that came in. So listen to this uh, comment by Heather. Hi, this is Heather from Ohio. I wanted to comment on Susan's talk today about women in engineering and how different their applications read. I was really glad to hear that admissions officers are trained to look for the differences in female versus male students in engineering applications. As a high school physics teacher, I see this in my female students in that many of them that have the characteristics to be a great engineer don't see themselves in that role because they were not a tinker when they were little, that maybe they didn't play with Legos or you know they're not what we call natural born engineer. But there's a lot of different types of engineers. Not every engineer is a natural born. And I try to open up the eyes of my female students, some who I think don't often see themselves in that role. A lot of female students do tend to start in biomedical engineering and with that as a possibility. But I found that once we open their eyes to other things and they have experiences a lot of them consider other fields in engineering beyond the more female driven. Anyhow, great to hear Susan speak about it. I was very passionate about this topic and I was really excited. And I think this is really helpful to everyone. Thank you. 
And friends, I wanted to share that with you because I wanted you to see the versatility of SpeakPipe. You can use it to give feedback to one of our co-hosts. You can give use it to give feedback to one of our thought leaders that we interview, like Jenna from, from Milwaukee did, to Arlene Cash, and we'll be sure to forward it. So if you want to relay a message to us, just go to speakpipe.com forward slash YCBK, hit the record button, or we always have it in the show notes. And also, if you go to your cosmodkid.com, you'll see it there as well. Um, and I also want to thank Susan. I thought it was fantastic, her insights on gender. And, and I'm glad to know that you, our listeners, appreciated it. Okay, so today I'm going to have uh, six higher ed updates for you. Uh, no question. We only have a question if we feel like we're getting a little bit behind on the speak pipe questions. And then we'll do a uh, Monday, Thursday. We might even do two Thursday, depending on how far we are behind. Uh, but we're in pretty good shape right now. I think we've recorded all but one of the questions that have come in. So we'll be doing questions for the next three weeks for SpeakPipe and not on Monday episodes. And then uh, we'll have the final part of Kirby McKillier's great interview on how to know what your college major or your career should be. So the first announcement is a pretty big one. I had to take a double take when I saw this broke on March 2nd. Columbia University becomes the first Ivy League institution to go permanently test optional. This is a big blow to the college board. They'd really hoped with rolling out the digital SAT and all the hullabaloo and fanfare and momentum that they could get going into 2024, that they would not have some of the most prominent institutions in the country saying that they were permanently going test optional. Uh, I know this comes as a big, big, big blow. And of course, they get first mover advantage. They get the press that comes with that. So now Cornell had announced a few years ago they were test blind for certain for for certain programs, but not all. Uh, this is both for Columbia College and for the engineering school. And basically, what they said in their announcement is that it allows flexibility for students to represent themselves fully and showcase their academic talents. In other words, that's a way of saying that we have enough information without scores to get an adequate read on a student. Um, I'm not naive about the fact that there's marketing benefits to schools, and they're not naive about that too. More applications, more applications from incredibly hard to reach demographics so they can shape and craft their class. Nothing's wrong with that is an ancillary benefit. So this is worth following because, believe me, schools are looking at what their overlap schools do. And so this just makes it harder for Columbia's overlaps to require, require the test. Now, remember, Harvard said no, they were test optional through 2030. So that's a pretty long time, you know, 2030. I mean, that's a while. And, of course, I'm talking about the college class 2030, not the high school class. So high school class 2026 while they study it. So anyway, we'll return to this and see um, who else joins this group. But the group is it's at the point now where when we have somebody like Purdue on a month ago that made a different decision, it, it's almost startling, you know? I mean, right now, literally, as far as a school-based decision, Purdue, MIT, Georgetown, that's it. There are a few other states that public schools or their board of governors have made the decision, but on individual schools, that's it. At one time, it would have been absolutely unheard of to think that a school like Columbia would abandon the SAT. While you have a 53-year track record of liberal arts schools like a Bowdoin and Bates is plus 40 years now, it's been a long tradition for a while now of liberal arts schools. You can just, I can't, so many I can't even list. In fact, pre-pandemic, more than half of the most highly rated uh, liberal arts schools had gone test optional pre-pandemic. But it's still always a pretty major story when the national universities did it. Remember, it wasn't that long ago when Temple said test optional or Arizona State or Wake Forest. That was maybe 07 now. George Washington, that was a big story. And then since we've been doing this podcast, we call it an emergency podcast. It was such a big deal when the University of Chicago did. So pre-pandemic, you really didn't see a lot of movement amongst national universities. Um, big story. Our second story is an encouraging story to me. So... Governor Maura Healey is the brand new governor in Massachusetts. She has, in fact, she just started in 2023. That's how green and fresh she is. But her first budget proposal is encouraging a lot of people in education. 
it would increase spending on colleges, public colleges and universities in the state of Massachusetts by almost 25 percent. It would keep prices flat for four full years. So let me just take a step back before I make comments on this. We've had a lot of conversations in the past about why have college costs risen so much. And there are lots of debates on that topic, but some of the strongest arguments are these, and not giving them in any particular order. Honestly, just the order they pop into my head. As long as you have a loan system, like Parent Plus loans or private loans, where you can have almost unlimited borrowing, colleges are not incentivized to keep their costs down. They can just keep racking up the price and pass it on to the consumer. And as long as people feel I have to go to college, whatever price it costs, I just have to do it, then there's no incentive. Um, Another argument is administrative bloat. Administration has increased substantially, and that adds to the cost. As you know, I've said many times that Valerie, faculty, staff, admin, salaries, and benefits is the major, single biggest cost by far for any institution. Another argument for the cost of college rising is public demand. So in other words, um, most of us who went to college, we had traditional dorms, quarter style dorms. Now show that to most teenagers and they'll be, "Uh uh-uh, not happening. Now they want things like sweet style with all the bells and whistles. And that's just one thing, dorms. You've got other things, like student centers, and you want the rock climbing walls and the lazy rivers and all these things. And then your students expect more when it comes to mental health, and they want more when it comes to um, academic supports, and they want more when it comes to career services. Not saying that these things are bad. In fact, they are not bad. I'll say the opposite. They're great, but they're not free. So the public demand driving up the cost, that's another argument. And the fourth strongest argument is the fact that as the states in particular, but also the federal government, both really, have walked away from their commitment to provide funding for students, whether it's something like a Pell Grant or it's something like need-based state aid, and states have decided to appropriate their budget to other things, whether it's K-12 education or pensions or hospitals or roads and bridges, I mean, all kinds of other things, the cost has been passed on to the consumer. Reality, all four of them play a role. But certainly, this last point is definitely a really major one. If you looked at the percentage of the budget that was once covered by uh, state or federal money compared to now, it's you'll think that, you know, that has to be a typo. So it's encouraging to see what Maura Healy is doing here. And now this budget still has to get through. It has to still be approved. Um, but once again, it would freeze tuition at the University of Massachusetts Uh, five campuses. So seniors would roughly pay the same amount they paid as a freshman. And at the state's nine public colleges and universities, where tuition is just a fraction of the fees, those those charges would be locked in to keep prices stable. And there's a number of reasons why I'm excited about this and Healy and others are as well. So Mary Grant, who's the president of Massachusetts College of Art, has said this is going to be a big incentive to complete degrees in a timely manner. Once again, it's a four-year freeze, not a five or six-year. So this should increase four-year grad rates. Now, Chris Gabarelli, who's the chairman of the Massachusetts Board of Education and the co-founder of the nonprofit Transforming Education, says rising salaries and costs of benefits for faculty and staff are the biggest drivers of the cost for students. Campuses are also facing inflation, just like everyone else, he says. So Healy's proposal would be a $59 million proposal. It also calls for transparency and predictability in pricing. And this is a response to a framework that the Board of Higher Ed unanimously approved of in December. Now, one of the things that um, was somewhat controversial in this program is that how they came up with the money. So they came up the money by having a millionaire's tax, okay? And the millionaire's tax raised a lot of money. It should be noted that Healy's budget has other big investments. It's not all about just school. 
She's got big investments in housing, transportation, and climate change. So the tuition proposal is part of a $360 million revenue from the new millionaire's tax. And how would that be appropriated? $93 million would go to expanding financial aid, a little more than $1 in $4. Another $20 million to pay for the community college for students who are 25 and older. So what happened was there was a constitutional amendment in November that was on the ballot. And it said, do you want to have a new tax on millionaires? And basically, it's a 5% tax. Uh, anywhere from, from 5 to 9, actually. It could be from 5% to 9% on only incomes, incomes exceeding a million dollars. So it's not Elizabeth Warren's ta taxing your assets. It's taxing incomes over a million. And this would generate billions of dollars. And it passed, but it barely passed. It squeaked by. Uh, but this is what it is resulting in, which is a huge influx of of money into the schools. And so this kind of had to, something had to be done because the costs had gotten pretty exorbitant. So the flagship school, UMass Amherst, had seen their cost triple since 2000, with tuition getting over 16000 and then mandatory fees being almost 1000 more um, on top of that. Um, now, it's true that the average UMass Amherst student received a financial aid grant of close to 10000 but not everybody did. So if the proposed budget is approved, then tuition will be locked in effective immediately for 23-24. And of course, that rate will be set by the trustees coming up here not too long from now, in late spring. Now, some of the reasons why me, uh, Mian is so excited about the guaranteed price is she believes it will provide a unique appeal that will allow the universities to market themselves to prospective students. So here's a quote from her. I think it's going to help us attract even higher quality students, Mian said. I think it's going to be great for the Commonwealth, but it's also going to be great for our students. And one thing Mian pointed out is that other states have tried these tuition freeze plans in the past, but they didn't have sufficient funding set aside to make it past year two. But in this plan, the, the money's there in advance, locked in with actually 24 just million just set aside for, for future years. So some of the people that are most excited are mass art, what's tough for the art schools um, and their funding. So the president has come up from there and say, said that she's heard students saying they wish they knew how much their educations would wind up costing them. This is changing the dialogue from seeing higher ed as an expense to seeing higher ed as an investment, Grant said. I think that's so encouraging. So stay tuned. I'm completely supportive of what governor is doing there and props to her. All right, our third story of the day, and I almost read the story last week. So Colorado College has broken away from U.S. News, not the medical, not the law school, broken away from the main publication, the one that gets all these hits and sells all these magazines. This story broke about an hour after we took this episode live last, last Monday. Uh, pretty exciting to me um, for a lot of reasons. One of the reasons it's exciting is part of a new initiative that I really liking that Colorado College is doing, which is really making a commitment to under-resourced students. So L. Song Richardson, who became Colorado College president in 2021, says she's looking to change the college. Here's a quote. I want to become a national leader in access, social mobility, and opportunity. And Colorado College is doing a number of things. Their Stroud Scholars programs brings local high school students to campus three summers in a row, college prep guidance, also their Colorado Pledge Promise. Now, this is in-state students that earn up to $250,000. They can go to CC for the same price as the flagship Colorado at Boulder. And there's increased support for people to get into lower, lower income levels. And so they've seen their Pell Grant recipients, which used to be abysmally low, to be honest. They were not a leader. They were a laggard. They had been anywhere between 9 to 14%. But since 2019, they have been between 13 to 18 percent. Um, but exciting news to share. If you're a regular listener, you know, every fourth month, we're going to have a Colorado College rep come on and discuss our in the news articles. And I'm here to announce, drumroll, please. Da -da 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 -da. The first one will be the last Thursday of March. And guess what? We're going to talk about this. 
why Colorado College set, told U.S. News to go pound sand. So that's going to be a hot interview, and I can't wait to engage in that. So come back in a few weeks on a Thursday, and we're going to get into the nitty-gritty of all that went into that decision. All right, so our fourth story, and here's where I get a little sadder. No, it's not that dude down in the South of Florida, but it's a different governor. And this is not only our fourth point today, but it's a grinding my gears. The governor of West Virginia signs a campus carry legislation. It was just last week we talked about the shootings at Michigan State, UVA, and a litany of other shootings that have happened on college campuses and K-12 schools. Apparently, Jim Justice was not, who's the governor, by the way, was not listening to me saying that we need to love our kids more than we love our guns. So here's what he had to say about this new campus carry law in the state of Virginia. He said, it's a proud day for me. Now, they're one of 11 states. So they're not the only one. You've got Texas, Utah, and a bunch of others that have had this legislation in place for years. This is how telling his comments are. Did he get up and say, I want to thank the universities for your input as you helped us walk through this, learning what would be best for you? No. You know what he said? I want to thank the legislature for passing the bill over overwhelmingly, by the way, it passed. Now, check this out. And I want to thank the National Rifle Association for their support. Enough said. Now, you should know that this did not happen without some revoking and some backlash. The state's largest educational institution pressed the lawmakers fervently to reconsider the bill. Their argument saying the decision to have permitting guns on campus should be up to us. We should decide what's safe for us. University leaders cited their concerns, but, you know, this new Jim Justice, and how can he have the name Justice doing something like that? You know, all I have to say is the blood of anybody who dies by gun death on that campus is on his hands. That's how I feel. All right. Fifth story for the week. The court had a ruling on esports, and they said it's not protected under Title IX. You're like, whoa, 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 what's all this? All right, so controversy arose at Florida Institute of Technology, another pretty campus, by the way, in Melbourne, Florida, also known as FIT. What happened was six members of the men's varsity rowing team in October, they alleged that Florida Tech, FIT, was not in compliance with Title IX, that men were underrepresented as athletes at the institution. And there were more women athletes than men athletes. And so big lawsuit emerged. The response from FIT was that actually male and female athletes are a parody when you look at esports. So it went to the courts. And U.S. District Judge Carlos Mendoza ruled that esports programs at private nonprofit colleges like Florida Tech do not offer genuine participation opportunities under Title IX, which bans sex-based discrimination in federal funding. Okay, and the last story is just a follow-up for last week. I mentioned that oral arguments were starting for loan forgiveness um, with the Supreme Court last week. And all I'll say really about this is that we can't really tell by the oral arguments which way this is going. There were some strong voices that were raised for this is government overreach and Congress needed to approve and Biden did not have the authority to go forward and make this decision without congressional support. Certainly those voices came on, you know, came um, on the right very clearly. But there was also a mixed response because the other issue is their standing at all. Well, there were some strong arguments that came not only from the left, very clearly from the left, the three left just left leaning justices, but even from the right, there was some skepticism that has been raised, whether or not there is standing. And so what I want to do is read a quote from Judge Roberts, where he questioned whether or not there was standing. So in order to do that, you have to kind of understand there's two different cases here. So let me give a bit, bit of background. There's Biden versus Nebraska. So in Biden versus Nebraska, um, the, the lead is Missouri, okay? 
Um, and Missouri and its Mahela, which is an acronym for the Missouri Higher Ed Loan Authority. It's one of the loan servicers in um, in the state that services federal loans. So the suit was brought by six states, including Missouri, arguing that Biden's loan forgiveness was going to cut Mahela's revenue and therefore hurt the Missouri's bottom line. And so the argument Sotomayor made, it's hard to imagine how the state of Missouri can claim an injury here. When it's not, resp- it's not responsible for the debts of Mahela. It's not responsible for the contracts it enters into, said Sotomayor. How can you have injury if you, the state, have immunized yourself from any liability or any injury that Mahela can experience? Okay, now there's a second case, Department of Education versus Brown. Here you have two plaintiffs who basically said they were not getting the full benefits, the 20000 for Pell Grant recipients or the 10000 overall, they were not getting the benefits, so therefore it was not fair. And that this should have been aired publicly, there should have been a public record that they had a chance to weigh in on. Now, here's what Judge Roberts, conservative judge, said about that argument in the oral arguments. Chief Justice Roberts suggested on that reasoning, there's nothing to stop anyone from ever suing the government when it creates benefits that don't apply to everyone. We certainly don't allow everyone to come in and say, just because I would have a right to comment if this law was struck down, I therefore have a right to bring a lawsuit, Judge Roberts said. So I bring those arguments up just to say that based on oral arguments, we don't know where this is going. Stay tuned. And now this week's interview with a special guest. Okay, friends, no question today. I already explained that, but we do have the final part of the interview with Kirby McKillier. And as I said last week, this is my favorite part where Kirby goes in and explains how students can know how to pick a major, how to pick a career. Um, I think you guys are really going to like it. Take notes and listen and enjoy. I wanted to go back um, to your point about values, because when we had talked in... um, the, our pre-meeting, like that was such like a eye-opener to me because I don't think a lot of times I hear kids talk about or even think about what are my core values? What is it yeah. that I want? And then how does that line up with what my family wants? Um, wow. And it certainly started getting me thinking about my core values and, you know, yeah. how they have aligned or not aligned in my career. Um, you know, like, so I'm a lousy capitalist. Like, that's what I've learned in my career. Yeah, <laughs> but I love helping people. So right. it all worked out, right? Right, um, right. But somebody else in my field who wanted to, like, you know, make money um, and, you know, be very systematic about it, they would hate being a, a therapist, I think. Exactly. You know? you know, what research shows that most career dissatisfaction stems from this values mismatch. Mm-hmm. So what you're talking about, this values mismatch. Um, when I was in D.C. Uh, before working at CU Boulder, I worked in, <laughs> in um, research and political research, and it was intense. It was it was brutal. It was like bare knuckle fights. And it is just not my value. I mean, I believe in building people up, helping people. And it just made my skin crawl. The cussing, the screaming, the dirt digging. That was a big in, in, in research yeah i guess so even though it's like you well know. i was doing political research oh I so I, that keyword research. on political yeah that changes the, the dynamic yes. there doesn't yes it? and yeah. i loved learning about congressional districts and what constituents cared about i loved that i loved learning about what you know people care about in different parts of the country that was fascinating but i did not like the that negative because that's just not my value. I believe in right, you know, right. helping people. Mm-hmm. And I suppose if you had gone to a political research club at, you know, the college you went to then and you saw that there was all, you know, political machinations, you'd been like, ah, this is not for me. I do not enjoy this kind of intrigue. I'm going to go be over there. Goodbye. Yeah. And you might not have taken that job. Yeah. A really good I point. Mean, I worked as a paralegal um, for two years after school because I didn't know what I wanted to do. 
in life. And in my generation, if you didn't know what you wanted to do, you went to law school. Yes. So I started studying for the LSAT, but my dad was like, you should just go check that out. That's a pretty big commitment. And, yeah. you know, so I got a job as a corporate litigation paralegal. And within two weeks, I'm like, oh, I hate all, I hate all of this. I used to have fantasies that like everyone would be evacuated from the building, but all the documents would just burn. So I wouldn't oh, have to manage so them funny. or look at them anymore. That was like, I you know, that. the thing that I wanted most for them all just to disappear. So obviously, I, I realized quite quickly that I was going to have to find something else to do. Absolutely. Thank God you didn't go to law school. Think of the time oh, and the money. I know. Mm-hmm, absolutely. There's nothing like being miserable in a job, though, and you probably found this in your political research job, to to really get you thinking about um, what would be better to do with your time. And That's so true. I suppose in, in some way it was incredibly motivating for me to yes. uh, figure out um, what I should do. And it's funny because you talk about aptitudes. Like when you probably won't be surprised by this, Kirby, but when I was in elementary school, I got in trouble all the time for talking to my neighbor. Oh. All I wanted to do all day was talk. Uh, you know, right. nothing but bad, but I was just interested in what they had to say oh. and what they were doing and what's in your lunch. And, you know, and that's like, I realize now that's what I do. I talk to people all day long. That's my job. That's you know? perfect. Exactly. <laughs> Maybe. So it worked out. Like I ended up doing the thing that I was inclined naturally to do. But that's what right. happened, you know, not in this lovely systematic way that you pointed out. It was like like by accident, you know? Right, right, right. I know. I do think you can save a lot of time, a lot of heartache, a lot of money. I was mm -hmm. thinking about that. Think if you're an out-of-state student at, CU, at UC Berkeley and you're trying to get out of one, one college and transfer to another and it's brutally hard and taking a lot of time. I mean, that's like $75,000 a year that yeah. you're sitting around. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's it's, it's hard. really expensive. Yeah. Yeah, you make a good point. And so hopefully this will, you know, maybe I think kids get anxious about this stuff. Like they don't want to think about the future because it makes them nervous. Um, but perhaps if they learn that, like, yeah, it's really what should make you nervous is not thinking about what you want to do in the future. Yeah. That's the scary thing, because then you're yes. going to get into some of these situations. Um, yes. And, they, you know, it might be expensive or unpleasant. You know, and it's just like, what did Einstein say that like, if you give a fish a bicycle, think it's an idiot or something? I I'm, I misappropriated that phrase. But like, if you are always doing something you are bad at, like, yeah. you are going to feel terrible about yourself. Yeah. You know, but if you do something where it's just natural to you and you shine it and you love it, you're going to your self esteem is going to be as, as it should be, you know, where it it, it should be where it deserves to be. Right, right. Absolutely. I mean, in a way, I would also try to tell kids, this is fun. You're learning about yourself, mm -hmm, about what makes mm -hmm. you happy, what makes you click. And this maybe doesn't have to be such a chore. It can be, I don't know, I'm being kind of unrealistic, maybe, but the joy of self-discovery. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, you know, but and I think just like lightening it up. And I think I can yeah. easily see why you've been so successful. Um, because you're just such a, a positive person and warm and a great listener. So I think if anyone can get kids to do that, it's going to be you. Um, oh, you know, you. but like just trying to lighten it up like this is fun. This doesn't have to be scary. It doesn't have to be hard. Um, it's just you know, you don't have to make any decisions. You just have to kind of explore. Exactly. And think about. Explore. And like, here's a trick. Let's say you're super duper shy and you're afraid to go to office hours. Take a friend with you. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever mm -hmm. it takes to get you to, to reach out of your comfort zone and talk to an adult. Right. Right. Yeah. My daughter, you know, I think she's very outgoing, but she still has had some issues with that at Elon, like she doesn't want to bother anybody. But then at the times when, you know, she has gone and talked to professors where she needed help. I mean, it was unbelievable the things that happened and how welcoming they were. Like she, you know, wanted to get on a certain activity and she, her application had got rejected. And so I said, why don't you just email the advisor? And she did. And with like 10 minutes, she was on a Zoom with that advisor. It was like, Aww. okay, you applied for the wrong position. No. Next time apply for this position. You know, and then, you know, then it's been great. Um, I love so. that story. I wonder sometimes if this generation is just so accustomed to Googling and to texting 
Yeah. It's very scary for them to pick up the phone or to go to office hours. Right. I, I think right. it's an issue for them and they just need to push through it. Because you're yeah. right. They're going to be so pleasantly surprised. It's going to be awesome once they get there. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Like most people don't go into education to like be mean to people. I mean, there's probably like, you know, 2% or something. Most people go into education because they like people and they want to teach people and they want to help kids and they, it makes them feel good to help kids. So. Right. And it's their passion, their subject that they love and people want to talk about what they're interested in. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, this has been great, but you know that no guest on your College Bound Kid gets away without being on the hot seat for their first okay. interview. Okay, all right. And I say first interview because you have so much expertise. I would love to have you back for more interviews and get oh. into a little more depth about some of these issues that we've talked about. But for now, um, there are some hot seat questions coming up, and that's where we just ask you a few questions about yourself that have nothing to do with this subject, just so people can, you know, figure out a little bit more about who you are. So my first question is about binging snack foods. What's your favorite binge snack food? Huh? Oh, I'm so embarrassed. You couldn't be embarrassed. I'm sure mine is worse. It is hilarious. <laughs> it is candy. Candy. Oh, candy is so good. Oh, Skittles. <laughs> Oh, I got a big bag of Jelly Belly. Mm. Oh, jelly beans. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. I sound like I'm in first grade, but yes. Um, and I have no to candy. give it to myself in a little, little bitty bowl or all finish the whole bag of it. Oh, it's so easy. I mean, I um, lived quite close to the Jelly Belly factory when I lived in Illinois. Um, and so it was so easy. You could just buy a bag of Jelly Belly jelly beans and you could go through it and not even know that you did. Oh, um, thank and God. they're all the different flavors. Like they have all, yeah, it's, those are super addictive. Thank so. you. Thank you for making me feel less <laughs> juvenile. <laughs> Oh no, candy is candy is awesome. Now my <laughs> pancreas is telling me Lisa candy is not awesome. But oh. you know. <laughs> but I'm sure so mine great. is All too. Right. So what kind of music do you like to listen to? I'm gonna be dating myself. I love like um this is so bolder too. Like um folk music, like singer songwriters. Like Mary Chapin Carpenter mm-hmm. and just really mm-hmm. mellow. Mm-hmm. Where you can understand yeah. the lyrics and they're not so <laughs> negative and so <laughs> offensive. Yeah, I know what you mean. I yeah, love I'm like always Indigo Girls. To- yeah. I'm always listening to that in the car and my daughter, 15 year old, is like, really? Really? This is what you're listening to? I'm like, yeah, you can put your headphones on because like, you know, mommy needs calming music in yes. traffic. So yes, <laughs> yes. But yeah, no, that's great. And so like what kinds of TV shows are you into lately or movies that you've you've seen recently? Gosh. When you're eating the Jelly Bellies, what do you like to watch? Oh, busted. <laughs> That's totally the combination. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So I oh, I've been so bad lately with Netflix. I've been binging. So I would say I love like kind of like Friday Night Lights. Did you mm. see that? Oh, that's so good. Yeah. World class. Um, I like kind of feel good dramas. I'm, I'm watching something. I'm just embarrassed to admit now. Emily in Paris. That's very oh, binge worthy. Yeah, that's very popular. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's escape, right? I Total escape. Think- when you do what we do, like I cannot watch reality TV or something that's really heavy where everyone's uh-uh. miserable and sad. I'm like, ah, I did that all day. I need to watch something where people are silly or yes. people are falling in love or they're in a beautiful city. So yes. I totally, totally yes. get that. So I've been watching some of that. Yeah. Uh, we'll have, to, you know, I have uh, recommendations for you and I'm <gasps> sure for me, but have Ooh. you watched Ted Lasso? Oh! Um, yeah. <laughs> World class. Yeah. <laughs> World co- When's the next one coming? I'm on. I don't know. I keep needles. waiting for <gasps> like the next season because I love <sighs> Ted Lasso, that character so much. Um, the best. So, the best. Just the you best. Know, I just stare at my son's soccer coaches and just with just utter disdain now. Just looking <laughs> You're at like Ted Lasso. <laughs> yes. What could be? What could be? You know? <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Bringing out the best in people, not taking yourself too seriously. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, I no. love that. Yeah. You know, Mark, it's, you know, when he's editing this, he's not going to know anything that we're talking about. It's like we just spoke a foreign language for the last really? five minutes because he never watches TV, but I'm sure the rest of our listeners will. Oh, um, Mark, he's so. missing out. He's missing I out. Know. I know. We tell him this all the time. Oh, so Bad choices. <laughs> bad choice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were talking about, um, I don't know if you, like, he and Linda were doing a um, spotlight on Caltech, and she's okay. like, "Well, yeah, it's really popular because of the Big Bang Theory show." And he's like, "What?" I'm like, <laughs> oh, "He's Mark, living in a hole. Him. He's living yeah. in a hole." <laughs> Sorry, Mark. He needs to get you, his priorities straight. <laughs> Mark, make something yeah. a good use of your time. <laughs> um, well, and we always finish with just asking, "What is?" the um, advice you'd have for three groups of people. And one is wow. students, one is parents, and one is college counselors, because that's about 10% of our audience. So oh, interesting. what pearls of wisdom would you have to share? Parents, students. Students, I would say, do these free online assessments. Mm -hmm. Like one was called SCORE and one was called Naviance. Go to the self-discovery yeah. section. Do just a tiny bit of it, 15 minutes. Also, think long and hard about, you know, if you want to go to a big state school um, and the major you want to apply to is crazy hard, be content mm -hmm. with your plan B. Mm -hmm. uh, Absolutely. I would say that. Um College counselors, I would say, and maybe y'all already do this. You probably do. But really spend time thinking about this major thing. And I know everybody mm -hmm. dives mm -hmm. in and wants to see the list and what are the stats, right, right. my odds of getting in. But I think it's really important that you look at schools um, and make sure they offer a field that you're interested in. Yeah, I mean, I know what you mean, because sometimes people are like, well, I want to study X. And so then we just say, okay, what are the schools good that in X? And then we go make a list. And sometimes I wonder, well, how do you know if you really want to study X? You yeah, know? I think um, that's a great question. So I like the idea, you know, really just trying to get kids to think about that a little bit more, as well as look at places where you can do, like, a lot of things, you know? Yes, yes, yes. And I would say... I'll say this would be my parent advice because parents are usually paying for this. Let's <laughs> say you are torn between two courses of study and one is crazy hard to get into and one is, is not. I, I might go ahead and apply to the really hard one because it's going to be super hard to get into it later. And you're right, going to spend right. a lot of money trying to work your way upstream. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you yeah. are 50% or more convinced you want to major in film studies, for example, or um, film and radio or something that's got a tiny, you know, admission pool, mm -hmm. but your, your kiddo thinks there's a 50% or higher chance I want to do that, I would, I would go for that. It's easier to go from hard, you know, and competitive to, to something broader to get out of that later. Yeah, no, that's really great advice, I think, because yeah, um, that can save you a lot of time and, and money and angst. You know, and I, I hate this. I, I listened to see you talk at their big admission spiel this summer with my son, Reed, or maybe last spring. They are not super honest about how easy it is to get out of certain colleges and into others. They really gloss over that. And they want to make everything seem very seamless and easy. You can skate this way, skate that way, design your own major. That mm -hmm. is not my experience working with students. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, that would be another thing for students and parents is just to, you know, really, if you're thinking that you might change majors or, you know, and you're at a big state, so talk to students about it. Talk to other, you know, parents of kids who go there. Talk to some professors. Get the real skinny um, before mm -hmm. you commit because... I mean, there is a lot of marketing involved in these college admissions presentations. And, you know, mm -hmm. it's not always a they're not going to bring up all the negative stuff. Well, you know, if you have to talk to that guy, it's not happening for you. I can just tell you that they're not going right. to say that. No, they don't. Um, they make it sound yeah. easy peasy. 
transfer here, transfer there. <laughs> that wasn't my experience. I mean, maybe certain directions, certainly into arts and sciences at CU was, was right. way easier. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, yeah. and every school's different. Every school has what, you know, they're super competitive. My good friend's daughter um, just tried to get into film and radio at TCU and they have very few s- spots and you have to apply mm-hmm. to that major and she didn't get in, but you know, so be it. Yeah. Well, I'm sure she'll get in someplace if that's what she really wants to do. I mean, you know, I mean, at some point, if you know that's what you want to do and, the, you know, you just have to go where you get in, I think, yeah. in that thing right. so that you can pursue your dreams rather than saying like, oh, but this school is more prestigious. So I want to go to University X, but I won't be able to study my passion or University Y maybe is a little bit less prestigious or less well known, but will you know, let you study that yeah. and give you the experiences. I mean, that's kind of an, an important decision to make. I do think. you find that most students you work with? Which camp are they in? They're more focused on the school or the major? A lot of them are more focused on the school. Yeah. And that's why I love this interview because it's going to give them some really um, very systematic ways to look at the major. And, you know, yeah. if you know yourself, it's much easier to figure out what college is going to fit you and what yeah. major is going to fit you. And if you don't, then you're looking at like, oh, you know, <laughs> so I, I, one of my students, and I love him, but he said, like, his mom wanted him to apply to Stanford, which, you know, no one ever gets into Stanford hardly right. anyway. But, right. um, you know, he told me, well, and without even looking, at school, I'm not going to apply there because there's this guy in my class who I don't like, and he's going to apply there. Right. And I'm like, now that is some logic. Yes. <laughs> right. I mean, Absolutely. a lot of times, like, yes. you know, kids will use this kind of very, like, like not well thought out logic to make these decisions. And of exactly. course, you know, Stanford wouldn't have been a good fit for him, but that's not the reason to reject it. Right. 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 And I think similarly, there are just a few majors that have a lot of buzz about them th- that all their friends are talking about. Right. And right. I think it's important that kids keep an open mind that there mm-hmm. are, you know, 70 other majors at some of these big state schools Exactly. Do not exactly. think that there's just five majors. And mm-hmm. sometimes students will be like, well, you can only get a job with these three majors or these five. Ma-. It's not true. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no. And I mean, I suppose like maybe a good topic for your next interview could be, you know, for instance, I hear people say, well, I want to make money. So I need to go be a business major, which yeah. I mean, that's that may or may not be true. But there are certainly yeah. plenty of people who have made a lot of money who have never went to business school. True. Um you know, and so really trying to unpack that more for people. I agree. I agree. And I wonder sometimes this generation, they almost seem like they have fewer and fewer things they're considering. Or maybe it's just my boys. Maybe they're just square. But, um, <laughs> um, I don't know about that. Um, I, you know, I've, I've met your sons, one in real life, one in virtually, and I think yeah. they're, they're great. But, you know, I just think that it's scary. And I think, you know, teenagers, like, as you know, like their peer opinions are more important than like my opinion for my kids or, or even like a teacher's and like, so peers have such an enormous influence. And, you know, a lot of teenagers aren't super versed into like, you know, what all the majors are. You know, it's kind of like you go along with the crowd and nobody questions. Absolutely. Absolutely. And like one of the erroneous beliefs at CU is, you know, Econ is for losers, you know, for people who couldn't get into the College of Business and be finance majors. Well, I happened to play tennis with an econ professor, and she just waxes eloquently about the richness of the curriculum, her amazing students, fabulous job, like they're great writers, great thinkers, really good critical thinking. And she's just the opposite. She trashes the business school for being too applied Mm -hmm. and too narrow. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I do think it's really important for kids to push themselves and talk to some adults and not just their friends. Absolutely. Well, I guess we'll end on that very, very wise advice. Kirby, thank you so much for coming on. It's such so much fun to talk to you about this. I feel like I could keep going on for hours with you and I hope you'll consider coming back because you have so much expertise that can be so helpful to our listeners. And I really appreciate it. Oh, thank you, Lisa. All right, girl. Good to see you. (laughs) You too. On Thursday's episode, 
Vince is my co-pilot, and we'll be discussing an article in the Washington Post called The Less College Students Sleep, The Worse Their Grades Are. A question from a listener comes from UN in California, and she's seeking advice for parents about how to handle the difficulty of waiting on your student's decision. So Lisa will, will be our expert who will answer that question for us. And we have a brand new interview, and it's with Allison Merzel, a former grad school admission officer for 15 years at Ohio State, currently a private college coach in Ohio. And Allison will be helping us to understand the challenges Jewish students face on college campuses, how to know if a college is a safe space for Jewish students, and how to support Jewish students. And this will be part one of three. And our college spotlight Lisa recently visited UNC Wilmington, and she will be helping us to understand another underrated gem, part one of two. And friends, remember, it's not where you go. It's not where you go. It's not where you go, but it's what you do when you get there and what you do when you get out of there. See you on Thursday, friends. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. If you find this podcast helpful, please follow us and you'll get every single episode as soon as it is released. If you're interested, there are a few ways you can really support our podcast. You can click the share button and send it to your friends and acquaintances. You can help us pay our staff and our expenses by donating on our website. You can write a review for us on Apple or Spotify. I'm the producer of the podcast, but we have a fantastic team of 15. Shout out to our co-host, Dr. Lisa Ruff, Dr. David Williams, Linda Depker, Susan Tree, Vince Garcia, and Julia Esquivel. And to our substitute co-host, Sylvia Borgo. Our sensational sound engineer is Nemanja Matvich. Our amazing music is from Victor Allen Weeks. Marketing designs are from Kimberly Blass. Lily Parikh manages our Instagram. Our image editor is Talha Khan. Joy Stucker does our website episode updates. And our webmaster is Stylianos Dimitru. And if you want to have a coaching session with Lisa, Linda, or me, just text me at 404-664-4340. If you have a question you want us to answer, or if you have a recommended resource or article you think we should discuss, just send it to questions at your collegeboundkid.com. Our favorite method is for you to record your own voice at speakpipe.com forward slash YCBK. By the way, check out our website where you'll find lots of content that is not on any podcast app. Our website is your collegeboundkid.com. If you want to learn about other hot admissions topics, follow us on Twitter at YCBK Podcast. We think of you as our listening family, and we look forward to meeting again with you every single Monday and Thursday.